Check one, two. Go! Go! Curious about real estate? Yes! Then you've come to the right place. Get the knowledge you need. Get over the fear and get started. This is the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show with your host, Michael Quarles. Hello, everybody. Michael Quarles with podcast number 81. Today, we have five questions asked by investors like yourself who wanted to, to know. Here we go. Question number one. For a new investor, could you explain the escrow process and what the escrow and title company does for you on a deal? Great question. So depending on your area, you're either going to use an escrow company or a closing attorney. Either way, you're still going to have a title insurance company. So what a title insurance company does is ensure that the person who says they are the seller is actually selling the property to you and they can, and that any of the encumbrances that are on the preliminary title report that you're agreeing to buy or any, any um, easements or mineral rights or any of those kinds of things um, is in fact true. And so it is insurance and that if something isn't true, as long as it wasn't fraudulently presented to title, you can make a title claim and uh, recoup some damages. As far as escrow, what escrow does is they're the impartial company or person who carries out the terms of the agreement. So what happens is we send the agreement that we have with the seller to escrow. The escrow company orders the title policy. They draw up, in our case, the grant deed. Some, some cases it's gonna be a warranty deed. They'll draw up any instruments like notes or addendums or what have you. They will collect the money from us according to the contract and they will give it to the seller according to the contract. And they'll also request beneficiary statements or payoff statements from the underlying liens, both voluntary and voluntary. So anything that comes back on the prelim title report that shows that's owed against the property, they'll call and get payoff amounts from that They'll prepare what we call the HUD-1 statement, and they'll do the accounting for the entire process. So rather than an investor handing their money straight to the seller and not knowing if that seller, one, is the actual owner, or two, if the seller is intending on paying anybody off or carrying through with those intentions, the escrow closing company does all that for us. So it's a vital part of what we do. Great question. Question number two. I really enjoyed your podcast and listened to them, to them all. Thank you. I just heard on a recent podcast regarding a question about direct mail sequence and type that you recommend a mailing sequence which includes a non-standard yellow letter, second piece, large type postcard, third piece, professional letter, fourth piece that aren't available on your website. How do we follow your guidance and suggestions without having access to the specific mail pieces you recommend? Those pieces are all available for my coaching students and, um, that's simply all you have to do is become a coaching student. You have available to you all of the pieces that I use that I have found right now are performing at, its, at the very, very best. That doesn't mean, however, the other pieces don't perform well. I just know that the ones we're using now are performing a little bit better. Thanks for listening to Buy, Sell, Fix, Flip. We'll be right back. Are you running out of leads? It's time you tried Yellow Letters at yellowletters.com. Get motivated seller leads through yellow letters, postcards, zip letters, typed professional letters, greeting cards, door hangers, and business cards. Yellow Letters is a full service marketing company created with your success in mind. Get the personal attention you need to get your direct mail campaign started and get in touch at yellowletters.com. And we are back in three, three, two, two, one. one. Question number three. There is a neighborhood in my area that is starting to undergo a big change and is turning from lower income rents in the thousand range to rents in the two thousand range for the same building, but with renovated units. What would you recommend for a marketing campaign to try and find multifamily houses or buildings? Well, again, I would just send my, my six pieces of mail, my small postcard, my yellow letter, my large postcard, my professional letter, my greeting card, and my zip letter. And those folks would find me, call me, we'd make a deal, and we'd do it that way. As far as an area going up in rents or, or, or changing or, or drastically increasing in value, that's just part of what we do. We wanna make sure that we understand 
how fast a market is changing. So we run some monthly marketing um, market uh, statistics. What we want to know is we want to know how many units are on the market for sale, how many are in sale pending status, how many are in sold status for the month before, how many expired. And this will kind of tell us what our market is doing and how long our market requires for the inventory to, to roll over. So how many days for that inventory to roll over. We also look at days on market. We look at how many cash buyers, those kinds of things. It's a really good report. We do it monthly. Question number four, what type of insurance policy do you need to get for a wholesale deal? Do you get a standalone policy for each property or do you get a blanket policy that will cover properties while you hold them for sale? I use a builder's risk policy most of the time. Rarely will I get a policy on a property individually, but I have done that as well. But our builder's risk policy is really nice and it's left up to us to report to the insurance company those properties we want insurance on. Now, if naturally, if we don't report to the insurance company the properties and it burns down, then we don't have insurance on it and that's our fault. But a builder's risk policy is the easiest one that I have found. Now, keep in mind, if I was going to do a buy and hold long-term rental, I would have an individual policy because a builder's risk policy isn't something that would suffice in that situation. Question number five. What do you do about properties that are in flood zones? Do you avoid them entirely? Do you get flood insurance? Well, I live in, I mean, Bakersfield's in a flood zone. Let's face it, if the dam broke, we'd all be about eight feet underwater. And if all the properties are in the same condition, I don't care about it. I mean, people are gonna live where they wanna live. And um, nope, never have got flood insurance. In some areas, maybe there's a bigger flood issue than other areas. And if that is, then you'd have to ask yourself if you wanna cover the flood insurance. I have my own opinions about that and buying the special types of insurance like earthquake insurance or tornado insurance or flood insurance, those kinds of things. In my case, I don't buy it. I just buy the standard risk policy. Great questions, guys. Thanks so much for sending in your questions. And remember, if you have a question, send it to support at bsffacademy.com. Support at bsffacademy.com. And uh, we'll answer your questions. Thanks so much. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Get more info and stay in touch at michaelquarles.com.